Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Good afternoon. I'm Patricia Aceves. I'm director of the TLT Faculty Center here at Stony Brook. And we're very excited this afternoon to have a wonderful provost lecture uh, from Dr. Tom Angelo. And we're thrilled that everyone has come on a beautiful August day. Uh, Charlie Robbins will give the introduction. And then we'll get right into our very interactive presentation. Thank you. I agree with Patricia that this is just wonderful to see so many people here this afternoon. Of course, we always fill the room for every provost lecture. The Stony Brook people laughed. Um, but it really is my pleasure to, to welcome all of you to this afternoon's lecture, which is, as I said, a part of this year's provost lecture series. And I think that today's lecture really aligns perfectly with the work that we've been doing here at Stony Brook in terms of our academic success initiatives, in terms of our middle states reaccreditation preparation, and of course, um, specifically in terms of the Northeast Summer Institute. And, and those of you attending the Institute, I had the chance to meet many of you Sunday night when I welcomed you to, to Stony Brook, and I think this is really a great way to bring the week almost to closure. I know it's not quite done yet. Um, but we've got a combination here of people who, who have come from all over the Northeast, literally, to attend the Institute, as well as our own faculty, staff, and students. So we're really thrilled to, to really be able to bring this lecture to you this afternoon. Today's lecture, Deeper Learning by Design, seven key lessons from over a quarter century of research, um, really, I think, speaks to what many of the key issues in higher education are today that we've been struggling with that I know each of you at your home institutions have been struggling with. Dr. Angelo is the Assistant Provost and Founding Director of the Center for Advancement of Faculty Excellence, which, I mean, who can be against that, and Professor of Higher Education at Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina. Really impressive, over the past 25 years, he has served often concurrently as a faculty member and faculty developer, administrator, and researcher at institutions including Harvard, the University of California at Berkeley, Cal State at, at Long Beach, Boston College, University of Miami, as well as the American Association for Higher Education, Victoria University in Wellington, New Zealand, and La Trobe University in Australia. He has directed six university teaching and learning centers, four of which he designed and founded. And it's important to note, and I, I really take um, pleasure in, in noting this, that throughout his career he has continued to teach, particularly on the undergraduate level, and I think that that's really quite a statement. His research interests focus on formative assessment, curriculum renewal and design, and research-led teaching. His best let best known publication, Classroom Assessment Techniques, a handbook for college teachers, has over a thousand copies in print, and the third edition, which is substantially revised, will be published later this year. In this afternoon's highly interactive lecture, Dr. Angelo will consider seven potentially transformative lessons and their implications for promoting deeper learning through research-informed curriculum design. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas Angelo. My father is 92, and he's still very um, sharp and independent. And, and his view of all of this, you know, if he heard this and when he sees these things is, um, that long list of places I've worked, his view is, can't keep a job. <laughs> so, there's always a couple of views in this. Um, I might say later why it is that I've worked in so many places, but, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that, that I've been interested in change and improvement in higher education, and that I've often been hired to help bring about change and hopefully improvement in higher education by one provost or president, and then within three or four years, there's a new provost and president, and they've decided there's something else they'd rather do. Um, so, my advice to those of you who are young out there is um, don't focus your career on change. 
stick with research, it's a better bet. Um, we've still got probably some people who might not have a handout. So if, would you just put your hand up if you don't, so we have a sense of how many you are? Quite a few still. Um, Patricia and her staff are working hard on this. and. Um, Life will go on if you don't get one immediately, I promise you. We'll do a few things that won't require it, but they will get you one, and we may even be able to get a few more cheers. Um, now, throughout the session today, I'm going to ask you to be active, and I will ask you to um, work with and talk to other people. So this is a forewarning. If you're a person who doesn't like to talk to other people and or doesn't like to work, um, this is a good moment to escape, and you'll have a chance in a moment to escape without probably anybody noticing. I hope you'll stay, of course. What you'll find, I think, is if you do stay, that, that you might meet a couple of new people, and th those contacts might prove, uh, in fact, both pleasant and valuable in the longer term. So, um, what I'd like to do is get to work, if we could, um, and as we go on, um, as more handouts come, and as and or chairs come, we'll try to put those to good use as we go. Now, um, I want to just express my appreciation to all the people who made this possible. If you've ever organized an event like this, you probably know that even to put on a lecture like this actually takes months of people planning and working very hard. And um, the provost's office, obviously, and, and uh, the vice provost, the Faculty Center has put a lot of time and effort into this, and I was originally invited by the National Academies of Science, and I hope they don't regret that. Um, but I want to thank them and for all the work that they've done to make this possible. It's a pleasure to be here. My alternate title for this session um, is Thinking Otherwise, and I'll say why. Um, about 30 years ago, I, I went back to graduate school, and I was at Harvard sitting in a room like this, uh, with my cohort of PhD students and, and, and others. And, and uh, a person who was a very eminent researcher in higher education was giving a talk. Her name was Kay Patricia Cross. I had never heard of her, I have to say, at that time, 1983. And um, I didn't really know who she was, and I probably didn't really care much at that point. But she gave such a great talk that the theme of it has stuck with me through all these years. And, and I would never have imagined at that time that I would end up being um, a co-author and collaborator with her for many, many years. Pat Cross is alive and well and retired. And what Pat was talking about in 1983 was this. She said, it's really the, the mission and the responsibility of higher education and people in higher education to think otherwise, to look at the established truths and the things that we believe in our own beliefs and our own convictions and our own biases and think otherwise about them and ask ourselves, are we really sure? Could there be another answer? Um, is it possible that we haven't got this quite right? And I think she's right about that. Um, so today I'm going to ask you to think otherwise about some of the things that we do and think about in higher education and ask ourselves, are we really sure that, that what we're doing is, is the best that we could be doing? Um, and what evidence do we have to actually support that? Now I need to warn you, uh, if you're here, and again, you know, this is a good time to, to leave if this, if this upsets you in any way, but I think it's only fair. I won't read the PowerPoints to you, okay? You can all read faster than I can talk. <laughs> so, you've been warned. Um, are any of you under 18? I think we're okay here. Now, I know most of the people that from the, the summer institutes are scientists, but I, there are probably people here from the humanities and or people who through general education had um, you know, significant exposure to the humanities. Um, so we'll, we may need some help from the humanities people for this part of it and I'll ask them to feel free to contribute. Um, how many of you would say that, that you're familiar with the myth of Sisyphus? And you could say, what, I need a volunteer to tell us all basically in a sentence what it is, what it's about. Can I get a volunteer who has a strong voice and is willing to stand up and belt it out? Please, you have to talk to them, so if you'll turn around, I'll be able to hear you, but... Sisyphus has angered Zeus, and in punishment, he has to roll a rock, a big rock, uphill for all he can. <laughs> Thank you. Now, does he just roll it uphill? 
Is that the whole nine yards of it? I don't remember anything else. Okay, well that's a, <laughs> that's a very good start. <laughs> Anybody want to add anything to that? Yeah. Well, then just as he gets to the top, it always rolls right back down. Really frustrating. So he has to just right. So he pushes this rock up the hill every day, and at the end of the day, he gets to the top of the hill and the rock rolls down the other side and he has to push it back up, and you know, this goes on and on and on. Does this remind you of anything in your life? <laughs> Think about this. There are a lot of downsides to being Sisyphus, but there are a couple of good things about it, right? Um, do you ever feel like that? Like you just keep doing the same thing over and over and it never kind of gets any better? There he is. Now the downside is he's got to do this for all eternity. The good side is he has buns of steel. <laughs> you know what I mean? He can eat anything he wants. Right? <laughs> he never has to worry about carbs. Hey. <laughs> um, or maybe if you're in higher education like I am, you feel more like So here's poor Sisyphus, you know. Not only is he not going uphill, but the, the rock is in danger of rolling him downhill, right? He's trying to hold it up, right? So he's, he's not really making any progress at all. Um, some of us who've been involved in education reform attempts since the 1980s probably feel more like this, you know? Because a lot of things that we were talking about in the 70s and 80s, and that we knew even then, still haven't actually been um, fully implemented in higher education. Some have, and I want to talk about some of the ones that have, but some haven't. So we'll talk about kind of both. Um, just a heads up for those of you who are interested in extra credit, okay? <laughs> so watch very carefully th for this, because it'll go by fast, but how many of you know what the parrot test is? Anybody? There might be one or two people who've heard me talk about this. The tram or bus test, some of you might have heard me talk about. And the parking lot test. Not sure, okay? You're being very timid here, but that's okay. Um, so watch for those. By the end of this, you'll probably know what they are. Now, since 1989, maybe even since before that, there are a few things that I think I've learned about higher education. These may sound to you a bit critical of, our, of higher education. If they do, keep these three things in mind, okay? So if you listen to nothing else, hear me now. Anything I say that seems critical to you about higher education is not referring to Stony Brook or any of the institutions you work at. <laughs> One. Two, it doesn't refer to any of the institutions you graduated from. <laughs> and three, it doesn't refer to any of the institutions your kids are going to or went to. Okay? <laughs> so there are 4,000 institutions of higher education, more or less, in the United States. So there are a lot of them out there that haven't really got it yet. Right? So keep that in mind. I'm going to try to provoke you here a little bit, so I'm going to see if I can get you provoked. Um, I think I can make a case for this. You're a first year student, you come to Stony Brook or anywhere else, and suppose you're first in family student. And I suspect you have probably quite a few still, right? Most places still do. First in family student comes, doesn't know anybody who's gone to Stony Brook, they sign up for classes, they don't know who they should take. I don't know why it's doing that. Um, <laughs> my magnetic personality. And whether they get a good person for freshman writing or not such a good person for freshman writing is really kind of a lottery. I think that's problematic for many of our students, that they're engaged in a lottery and they don't have much control over it. Third, no matter what we do, the outcomes depend on what the students do. There's a lot of talk about active engagement in the Summer Institute. I've been watching people talk about and try to get people actively engaged. What I'm going to say to you is getting people to be active is good, but it's not enough. Because the activity that you see most of the time is not the activity that matters, which is invisible to you. And that's the activity in their heads. So I'm going to say a couple of things about metacognition as we go. <laughs> this just gets better and better, doesn't it? It's on some sort, of, some sort of poltergeist thing going on here. Hard work is necessary but not sufficient. Now, generally I look better in the dark. 
You know, so if the lights are off, probably it's good. But let me say something about this. Um, and there's a lot of really good research on this. And if you have a handout and you're interested in this, look up Erickson, who's on my handout. And if you've never read about this kind of stuff, you'll find it interesting. But it's a, one of the references on page eight is Erickson. So if you're interested in this. Expert performance has been studied in a variety of domains of human endeavor. Many of you will know this. And it turns out that there are some things that, that seem to be more or less true about experts across fields. One of those things is how long it takes them, how much dedicated practice it takes them to get good. Right? Some of you know about this. It turns out to be world class at almost anything. It takes between 30 and 50,000 hours of the right kind of practice. 30 to 50,000 hours of the right kind of practice. Now think with me about this. If you're a blue collar worker and you work 50 weeks a year, you get two weeks of vacation, times 40 hours a week, that's 2,000 hours. So 30 to 50 hours is 15 to 20, 30 to 50,000 is 15 to 25 years of that kind of labor at that thing. Now, that's a lot, right? So what does it take to become New York class? Don't know. Might be a bit less than that. How, what does it take to become good? Many of you will know this, because the ancients knew this. It takes about 10,000 hours of practice, the right kind of practice, to get good at anything. Think back over your life and ask yourself, what have you done where you've practiced with attention and feedback for 10,000 hours? Go out on any playing field in any major university, whether it's basketball or football or lacrosse and anything else, and you will see people who at the age of 19 or 18 have put in 10,000 hours of practice. And you'll see some kids in academic life who've put in that kind of practice. And you'll see musicians and dancers and other people who have. But that's what it takes to get good at anything. So one of the things we have to think about is, are we in a position where we can help our students get good and or achieve that escape velocity by the end of university or maybe even a few years out? Because if we're not, they will never be very good. There is no shortcut. And the problem is this, you could spend 20,000 hours of practice, but if it's the wrong kind of practice, you won't get good. So it's not just time, but it's the right kind of practice, which is called in the literature deliberate practice. I'll talk a bit about that more. Okay? Hard work, necessary, but not enough. The problem is there's no way around it yet. There is no smart pill. There's no way to get faster yet. There may be in the future, but not yet. Now here's one of the things that gets me in trouble in every university I work in, and that is raising the S word. <laughs> People tell me we have high standards, I say, where are they? How would one know? Where can you find them? And they say, trust us, we have high standards. Well, you can see why that might be problematic to outsiders. How many of you give your students feedback and then they prove to you that they haven't actually read it or paid attention to it. Have you ever had that experience? Because they make the same mistakes over and over again? Okay. So I'm going to save you a lot of time, young people in your career. Never give feedback to students unless they are required to do something with it. I'll try to illustrate that later. But unless it's consequential, most people won't use the feedback. It won't be helpful to them. It will be a waste of your time. And lastly, this is sort of an extra. But this is something that Lee Shulman, who is the head of, for years, of the Carnegie Foundation, well-known educationalist, said uh, many times that too often in higher education we leave serendipity to chance. <laughs> Think about that. Universities are places where serendipity can occur in a million ways all the time for students and faculty. But to make it optimal, we need to actually engineer it. And sometimes we don't engineer that as well as we can. So today, there's a chance for some serendipity to happen. Take advantage of that with the other people in the room. So I talked about 25 years. 25 years ago was 1989. Many of you in the room were not born in 1989. Others of you were in primary school, right? How many of you weren't born in 1989? See, a couple of people, right? How many of you were in, were in primary school or before? See this? So I expect you to know nothing about 1989, other than it's a number that existed once, right? <laughs> for you. Um, but I'm going to argue that 1989 was an important year, and even if you were born after that, you should know something about it. Okay? So I've got a warm-up exercise, and you'll need to look on if you can with somebody. 
If you don't have a handout, you can still write the answers to these, and I encourage you to do it. They're very simple questions, okay? So you need something to write with and maybe a piece of paper. So your first task, does it say talk about this? No. Write down two or three things that you think happened in 1989, or if you're my age, that you think you remember happening in 1989, whether they did or not. And don't ask your neighbor yet. <laughs> Work on your own for a minute. I have such crowd control here, it's working really well. All right, moving on. Next question. Two, what percentage of the US population, I don't want you to talk about this yet, okay? Just jot down the answer that you think it is. And I really urge you to jot down an answer. Because if you don't, you will say later, when you find out the answer, you'll say, I knew that, and you'll be lying. <laughs> Only because you were too cowardly to write down an answer. All right? Cell phones. Computers. What percentage of households in the United States had computers in 1989? They existed. You know? They were there. Take my word for it. GPS devices in their cars or in cell phones. How many of you have been writing down answers? Raise your hand, honor code here, good. These people in the back, I can see you, you know. <laughs> I don't have my glasses on, I can still see you, so. You're on notice. Now I'd like you to, to write down something a bit more serious for a minute. And that is, all of you, I assume, are here because you're teachers or you're interested in teaching. And I'd like you to just jot down a note, a word or a phrase about Two or three key things you know about teaching that guide your practice. What do you know that you really look to and say, this is really, if somebody asked me what was important, I'd say this. This is really important. What are your core beliefs? And you can just signal those by a word or a phrase to yourself if you want. Okay, now, here's the hard part. I'm gonna ask you to, to, if you're sitting, I'm gonna ask you to stand up and turn to the people behind or in front of you. And in groups of about three, I'd like you to compare your answers to the first two questions very quickly. And if, if you think the person is hopelessly wrong, try in the nicest possible way to convince them. And you guys in the back as well, work with those people right in the back row. Two minutes, compare your answers on the first two. asking is, Patricia, but are more copies coming, do you think? Okay, head back to your seats. Say goodbye to your new friends for a moment. Did you find out their names? All right, you got 10 seconds to find out their names. Come on. Go ahead, people. I apologize for whistling 
as I said in one of my earlier sessions, I usually have a bell, but I can't get it through airport security anymore. So, uh, <laughs> so I, my whistle, I'm able to get through. Um, now, here's my question for you. How many of you want to know what the answers to these questions are? How many of you want to know? How many of you really want to know? Right. So, do you understand that I've tricked you? Yes. Right? I've tricked you. And to be honest, now some of you are looking at me like, what? You know, but most of you know where I'm going with this. Um, how many of you would say that you are more interested in knowing about 1989 now than you were when you walked in the room? <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> Not everybody's raising their hand, and that's, you know, I'd expect that. But about 90 plus percent of people, you know, find that this works. And so I'll ask you to think about this in terms of your own students and the kinds of things that you do. Is there, how many of you ever have to teach something that, that your students find boring? <laughs> the science guys, right? Um, I'm thinking, uh, how many of you ever, t ever have to teach something that you find kind of boring? Yeah, well, yeah. In those cases, you just have to act. You, know, you just have to, because if, if the students know you're bored, that's the end right there, that's the death, right? Um, but one of the things that I try to do in teaching stats and other things that are notably boring to many students is I try to, to find ways to pique their interest in it. And one of the ways to do that is to raise some questions, get students thinking and writing and predicting, and then get them, give them a chance to talk to each other and see that other smart people in the room don't have the same answers. Now this does several things. First, it makes it okay not to have probably the right answer, right, initially. And it also means that, that it raises some uncertainty in students' minds. Now I said earlier, if you don't write an answer down, when I tell you the right answer, you will think you already knew that. That's one of the ways our perception fools us. But if you've written it down and you see that it's not the right answer, then you're faced with seeing, maybe I have something to learn in this course. And that's an important step. It also is a way of driving a wedge, in, wedge he tried to say wedge, into our certainty, because if a person thinks they already know something, they won't listen. Why bother, right? Why would they listen? But if I can convince them that they might not know it or know it well, then they may actually pay attention. And attention is necessary to learning. Not sufficient, but if students aren't paying attention at all, they're not gonna learn anything. They won't remember anything. There's no chance. So what I've done is try to trick you into paying attention and to being interested. Now, would I say all this to my students? Of course not, because then they'd lose interest and stop paying attention. <laughs> but I'm saying this to you because I think most of you are teachers. How many of you are teachers or future teachers? Right? So pretty, why would you be here otherwise, unless you thought this was a grants workshop? Right? Which is what I said earlier when all these people started coming in. I said, they must think there's free money here. Right? But I'm going to say this and stop a couple of times to talk from what I'll call the balcony, to talk about this from our roles as teachers and say, we're doing these things, I'm asking you to pretend you're students here, but you're really not, of course, and I'm not a teacher in this room. But if we pretend that, then I can say, well, let's think about that and ask, could you possibly do something, adapt this in some way that would be helpful to you, and why do it? So I call the, the level of action, when we're pretending to be students, as I said earlier in the week to some people, forgive me for the repetition, I call that level the dance floor where we're working together, we're actually trying to learn something difficult, we're paying attention to the music and the steps and our partners and trying to learn all that stuff. That's your students. And then I'm gonna step with you up to the level of the balcony where we're looking down on all that happening and watching it go on and thinking, how could we improve that? Balcony is the level of theory, the dance floor practice. Balcony is the level of generalization, dance floor specifics. Balcony is the level of um, metacognition and the dance floor is a level of cognition. So we'll move back and forth in that. And what I want to suggest to you is that without highly developed metacognitive skills, students can't succeed in what we really think higher education is. Yet we rarely teach those things very explicitly to most students, I think. All right, so let's go back to 1989 and find out a little bit about what's going on with that. Um, so I'll just ask you to, to <laughs> I'll make this easy for you, okay? I'll ask you to write down just the numbers of the things that didn't happen in 1989, just the ones that didn't happen. So jot down the numbers, and then you can crib off your neighbor and see if they've got the same numbers either. So the things that did not happen in 1989. 
Any of you have any of these things? Some of those. Your neighbor's got the same thing you do? How many of you think at least five of these things didn't happen? In 1989. Some of you think never. Right? Should we look? Should I tell you? Now the first one was a gimme. If anybody missed that one, <laughs> don't admit it. All right. So I made these kind of easy, but look at all the things that did happen in 1989. Pretty big year. Those of you who are young, aren't you sad you missed it? Right? So this is just a way of focusing students' attention on facts. How many of you teach facts and expect students to learn some facts? I do. Right? So I'm trying to get a way to, to get them to think about the importance of these facts. And of course, the real importance is the interconnection of these things, right? Not just the facts themselves. Thanks for that. Now all of you know that a lot's happened in the, uh, the world of electronic communication and social media since 1989. This is one of those realizations, you know, the, the visualizations of the internet from a few years back, which looks a lot like the universe or the inside of your head, right, interestingly. So those are the nodes on the internet. We have no evidence that the speed of human information processing or the depth of processing has changed. It's not clear if it can in the amount of time that, that most of us live in. Over generations it might, but we all know that the information that we can move, we can move much faster than we can actually deal with. This is problematic in lots of ways for us. It's an, it's an advantage and a disadvantage. So let's go to the last, the second question. How many of you are close on that one? That's good. Right? So cell phones, you know, within a lifetime of a relatively young person. Did you get that? Pretty close? Good? Right? <laughs> so we want to ask students some questions they probably can't answer and some questions that will surprise them. And the surprising questions are important in, in terms of, you know, getting their motivation, their curiosity going, and also in sort of pushing them a bit off center so that they're ready to learn something. Now, page nine is the only important page in the handout. And I'm, I've been promised you will all get a handout. So you all get a page nine. But if you haven't seen it, take a look at page nine and hold it up for the folks near you who, do, who don't have a handout so they can see it. It's a mostly blank page. And what it is is a page to write notes on. So I'm going to encourage you to write notes on things you think you might be able to use as you're going along things you might be able to use in your own teaching. If you do that, then you can later review that list and critique it and decide that most of the things won't be helpful, but maybe one or two. If you don't generate as many ideas as possible, you're cheating yourself of an opportunity to get some new ideas. So one of the things that I can tell you from research is that critical thinking and creative thinking are not the same thing. They don't go on in the same parts of your brain. And if you try to do creative thinking and critical thinking at the same time, to generate ideas and evaluate ideas at the same time, what you'll do is switch back and forth and it's not very efficient. So do you know people who write and then they stop at the end of a sentence and try to make that sentence perfect before they write the second sentence? Ever met people like that? <laughs> Some of you are pointing at yourselves? <laughs> that turns out to be a really wildly ineffective and inefficient way to write. Much better to draft spill it all out there, and then come back at another time, maybe later in the day or later in the week, and revise it. You've all heard this. This is true, and it's neurologically based. So I'll ask you to be generative. Write as many ideas as you can, and then at another time, evaluate those ideas. Otherwise, you will inhibit your creativity. People who publish a lot don't try to fix what they're drafting as they're drafting it. They can't. So we've got some more handouts coming. Thanks to the hard work of Patricia and her crew. Should we give them a hand now so we don't forget?
All right. Now we're on page two now. We're speeding ahead. It's a joke. Speeding ahead. On page two, <clears throat> there's a list of things that people knew in 1989 about higher education. And this was the most famous list, the most famous summary of the research in higher education for a decade. The Wingspread Foundation, which was owned by or funded by the Johnson Wax Corporation, you know, the people who made wax, basically um, in 1986 called together sort of the most eminent researchers in higher education in 86, 12 people, 12 wise heads, and they said to them, what do we know about learning and teaching now that could help people improve? And so these people went away somewhere in Wisconsin, they worked for several days, and they came up with a short list. And at that time, this was the, the sort of best possible list based on research that we had. I remember it. Well, it came out in 1987. How many of you have heard of this list? Chickering and Gamson. Not many anymore, but in those days, hundreds of thousands of copies of this list went out by post. They had to. Right? There was no other way to do it. So these were their lists, and there was only one of these that was controversial at all in 1989 in terms of the strength of the research that supported it. Can you guess which it was? Seven. Number seven. Yep. And what I can tell you is that the good news is that all of these things, all of these points, have only been strengthened in the past nearly 30 years. And number seven is quite clearly valid. So in 1987, they were taking a kind of a risk. They thought there was enough evidence to make that claim, and they thought it was important to make it. But by the mid-90s, we knew that diversity can contribute, especially to the development of critical thinking. More on that later, if you're interested. And so the things we knew in 1989 still turn out to be valid, but we know a lot more about them nuanced in a nuanced way. Much more specific, much more about how it works in the disciplines. <clears throat> Here's the bad news. Most of those things still haven't been fully implemented you know, in most universities and in most courses and programs, even though we've known them for 30 years. Some of these things weren't new in 1987. We'd known them. So the research in higher education on teaching and learning is way ahead of practice still. And it just keeps getting further ahead of practice. And some of you are the people who are doing that. And one of the questions is, will we ever narrow the gap between what we know about good practice based on research and what we're actually doing? I think it's narrowing a bit. I have reason to be optimistic. Now in 2009, <coughs> George Koo and the American Association of Colleges and Universities uh, came up with a list of five, and I put a plus there because there are now more than five, high impact practices. Does anyone here, and there may be someone here, know if Stony Brook takes part in the National Survey of Student Engagement? You do. Probably many other universities that you're from do as well. You may or may not know. But it's a widespread survey that, that goes on not only across the United States, but in Canada, Australasia, and elsewhere, of st first year students and fourth year students. And based on this data with sophisticated correlational analysis, what they found is that there are five kinds of things that students do in college that seem to make a big difference. They're associated with a big difference in terms of students' achievement, persistence, and success in college. All right, here's the list. Taking part in first-year seminars, first-year experience, okay, academically. Being involved in learning communities. How many of you have heard of learning communities? Right? These two things have happened in a lot of universities. This is really good news. Service learning. I know some of you on your campuses, people will be doing this. Not just volunteering, but actually integrating the service and learning. Undergraduate research. How many of your, your campuses have undergraduate research programs? See, and these are all things that have happened in the last 25 years that are really good advances. Um, there was some of this going on years ago, but not much systematically. And lastly, capstone courses and projects. How many of you have those? Right. These can be transformational. I recommend it. Um, I've added a couple of things that have been, since that date, pretty strongly verified. One of them is study abroad or something like study abroad but in your own country. So there are places you could go from New York that would seem to you like a foreign country. <laughs> and vice versa, right? And you could have a transformational experience in those places, and some people do. And programs that integrate some or all of those. And what you'll see is that some of the high-powered colleges in their undergraduate education, especially often private 
places, but not only, do all of this stuff. And I could point to a few examples of them where students basically are engaged in their four years in at one time or another all or nearly all these things. Now there's another integrative practice that's very powerful that I know SUNY Stony Brook is engaged in, and that's the use of portfolios across courses and across years. And that's one that we're still collecting data on, but I think within three or five years we'll know that when portfolios are used well, that they can really play a powerful role in helping students succeed. They're a very um, widespread and useful tool. So those are some things we know. So if you wonder what works, these things work. What's the bad news about these? You can't do them by yourself. It takes a program. So, you know, paraphrasing um, one of our first ladies who was then a Secretary of State who may be the President someday. Um, she said it takes a village. I'm going to say it takes a program or it takes a course of study to actually educate a student. A whole major, a whole degree. One course isn't enough dosage or enough treatment to make much difference. One course, your courses, can inspire students, can motivate them, but it's not enough time and it's not enough dosage to actually make much of a difference in their education. It's just too short and too little. Important, but not enough. And so one of the things we have to get over ourselves about in higher education is the fixation that we have on individual teachers and individual courses. We're important, but students live in the programs. We live in our courses. And it's the programs that really have the big impact on student learning when they do. So here's where we have to think otherwise. We have to sort of think outside of our own experience in some ways in that regard. So page three. I've listed some <coughs> current beliefs that um, people express to me all the time, my colleagues, and what I'd like you to do is to take a look at those and I'd like you to mark them up. Just very quickly. So there are, you know, several things on there go very quickly. If you agree with the statement, put a plus. If you disagree with it, put a minus. And if you're not sure, maybe not sure what it means, put a question mark. And do all of that in about 90 seconds. So you have to read really fast. and You won't be able to obsess about this or talk about it with your neighbors. Just bang through them. Plus if you agree, minus if you don't agree, question mark if you're not sure. Do you still not have a handout? We have an extra? Do we have any extra handouts up there, left? Well, I'm sure that, that folks would let you look off on theirs and that you'd find it more interesting if you do, probably, but. Are you finished? All right. Another few seconds. How are you guys doing up here standing? You all right? Sorry about that. Feel free to drag some more chairs in if you want. And find any. All right, can you guess what's going to happen next? I'm going to ask you to talk to somebody else. And so this time, this is your challenge. You've got to talk to another two people, but they cannot be the same two people. And they can't be people that you're related to, and they can't be people that you came with. So try to find two other people near you you can talk to. Very quickly, compare and talk about the ones where you've got a question mark or a minus. Two minutes, compare your lists, find two new people.
Okay, make sure you know their names. Make sure you know their names. Find out their names. Okay, back to your seats, please. How did you do? How did you do? Now, here's what, what I'd like to do. Many of these probably, you know, you had very clear feelings about. Were there any of them that in talking with your group, you had a question mark about? You just didn't know what they meant? Any question marks? What letter? E. D. <laughs> um, hmm. All right. Well, here's what let's do then. Um, I'm going to give you another 30 seconds or so. And I'd like you to, with the people that are just close by, very quickly decide on one of them that you'd like to talk about. Would you like me to comment on? Just one. are having too much fun. Now what I need is I need a couple of um, folks to, to tell me what you'd like to hear about and then we'll see if other people agree with you. So somebody who we had a clear consensus among your folks? Yeah. Are you talking about G? O. O. Okay. Cheating. How many of you are interested in that one? How many of you are interested in O? That's about a quarter of you. Um, any others in which you think there are a lot of people interested? E. E, inspiring lectures promote deep learning. How many of you want me to say something about that? Not very many. Not too many. Any other? N. N as in? You're still not listening. N is in collaboration. N. Collaboration. How many of you had N as one of the ones you'd like to talk about? Still getting a mixed group here, right? J. 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 How many of you had J? All right, J's a biggie. All right, so imagine we had this room set up such that you could vote with clickers or that you had done this at home before class on the LMS on the learning management system. So I, I would have this data already, which is what I do. It's a waste of class time to do this, but I have no choice at this moment. So I would know already which ones you thought were most problematic, right? And I would be able then to walk into my lecture and say, you know, um, we've got all these things which you're going to be responsible for on the midterm, but most of you seemed okay with, you know, about 12 or 15 of these. So I'm going to talk about the ones in which you raised the most questions. See where I'm going? Now why do this? One, from the balcony, makes better use of class time. If you're a utilitarian, if you want to do the greatest good for the greatest number, you have a better chance to do that in that regard. Two, choice promotes motivation. So if I give students some choice about what we're going to deal with, that makes them invest or makes it more likely they'll invest their attention and their energies in this. Not everybody will get their way every time, such is life, right? But more people will actually get to talk about the things that they think they need to know about. Now I know that most of my students know something every week about what we're going to talk about, and some of them know quite a bit. 
Unless I assess their learning, I may spend quite a bit of the class talking about a topic that I find interesting but which they already know. Not a good use of class time. Interesting for me, right, to talk for the nth time about you know, this, but not so interesting for them. So let's go to Jay. Let's go back to the dance floor. Students can usefully self and peer assess their own learning. This is really problematic. And a lot of times colleges and universities do this to try to save money. And I'll tell you what's problematic about it. If you look at the research on expert novice behavior, students are by definition, unless they're PhD students, novices of a type. Okay? And the problem is no one can assess above their level of understanding. Right? And most people can't even assess at their level of understanding. They can only assess down from the level that they're operating at. This is true of me and it's true of most of us. So when we try to get students to assess each other, unless they're actually above the level of the thing that they're assessing, they can't do it. Unless you provide them with a highly structured rubric perhaps, right? And unless you train them how to deal with the inherent conflict that that sets up of getting them to judge each other. Students see that as our job. And when they push back on this, that's why. They think it's our job to make those hard evaluative dis decisions. They don't want to grade each other. So they'll accept it if it's non-graded and if it's clearly set out such that they can help each other. But they don't necessarily like it. And they often will respond to this as to saying, why are we doing this when it's your job? The fundamental problem is not that one. It's that they cannot reasonably assess above their level or even usually at their level. And so if you want them to assess things, they have to assess things that are actually at a lower level than they're performing at. And if that's what you want, that's okay. Can they give each other useful feedback with the right rubrics and the right guidance? Yeah. They can. But that takes a lot of structuring. So here's the thing. Imagine you had a program in which as a program you work together or a course team you work together to develop those sort of rubrics and that sort of system. And imagine we trained our students in the first year to work effectively in teams. So that in years two, three, and four, we didn't have to train them again. That by the end of first year, they knew how to work well with other people. They knew how to deal with conflicts. One, employers would be thrilled. Two, the rest of us wouldn't have to deal with it. Right? And three, we know that the first year is the critical time to inculcate those sort of skills and habits in students, especially the first six weeks or so. So we have opportunities to do these things, but only if we work together as a program, as a college, as a school. Individually, I can do whatever I want, and I can do great things, and so can you. But if the rest of our colleagues don't do those things, then we're operating a lottery again. Whereas some students get a great experience, and other students don't. Not because they deserve it, not because they don't deserve it, but simply because they showed up in this room on the day. That cannot be excusable in a public institution. I don't think. I don't think. I don't see any way we can excuse that. That some people have a great experience and a great education and others, because of the door they walked into, have a lesser experience. That's pretty problematic. That's the way life works. Um, I'm not going to answer that. We could have a long discussion about that, but that's a view. That's what I call the Fox News view. Well, that's a view. Life is tough. Suck it up. Get over it. I'm a starting line liberal. I believe everybody deserves a chance to start and have an opportunity you know, to, to enter a level playing field. And if we don't create a level playing field in year one, when's it going to happen? So we could argue about that in another day. We won't today. Now, let me mention one other. <clears throat> oh, cheating. Um, the news on this is bad. I'm sorry to tell you. If you read the studies of cheating in college, it's widespread. Um, and most students admit that they do cheat, and most students will cheat under certain circumstances. That's the bad news. If you don't believe this, um, there's a popular book that most of the people on airplanes have read about this um, in here. And it's, I think I actually have it in my um, list. Anybody see it? I'm struggling to remember what, it, what the title of it is. It's about cheating. Uh, is it the Ariely? It's the Ariely book, Dan Ariely, who's a well-known psychologist and a researcher in this for years and years and years. Um, his book, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. So if you, if you want to read about the research in this in a way that if you're not a psychologist you can understand, that's a good book to read. 
The good news is this. If we create the right circumstances, most students won't cheat. But we have to create circumstances in which it's difficult to cheat and in which there's a consequence if they're caught cheating and in which students believe that they are likely to get caught. Which, in other words, is the same thing that happens with you and your income taxes. Right? And me. So, I've just moved to an honor code college and I hate to talk with my colleagues about this because although the honor code is a good thing in certain ways, it doesn't solve any of these problems. It's not enough. Um, and most of my colleagues at this college don't know that yet and I'm not sure when I'm going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> They're not going to be happy. Think with me from the balcony. Got a list of concepts, some of which might be controversial that you want students to deal with. What options do I have next? Can't talk about them all in class, online or elsewhere. Not enough time for that. I've picked some key ones that I think are difficult. We're going to talk about those in class. What could I do next? Projects. We could do projects. I could do a jigsaw and divide you up, right? And say each team is going to take one of these and do research on it. And you're going to post your reports up and then everybody can do it. So I could say at the end of the, the year, all of you are going to be responsible for knowing about the research about all of these. Your midterm and final will be drawn from these, but you don't know which ones. Right? That's an old trick from law school. It's an old trick, but a good trick. Right? And it can get students to do a depth of study and a breadth of study that they wouldn't otherwise do. So you might think about that. Take a look at page 9, see if there's anything you want to write down before it goes away. Then we're going to zip through a few things. Did I manipulate you into reading the list differently than you would have if I just said, read it? When I said, you know, mark it up. So one of the things we need to remember is when we say things like read to students, different disciplines mean different things by read. Students come with different ideas about read. And so if we want them to do something with the text, we might be well advised, especially with first years, to be very explicit about what we want them to do. And if we can make that into an action where they actually have to, you know, do something to the text, we're more likely to get the kind of cognition and the kind of investment of energy that we want. Otherwise, students may pass their eyes over the page but not actually remember anything. Have any of you ever had that experience? Reading at night, right, with your nooks and kindles, or even maybe a real book, and at a certain point you realize you have no idea what you've been reading, right? And you know that you've been doing something, right? You've been turning pages. <laughs> your husband, been. Have you ever arrived home in your garage or your driveway and not remember driving home? When you weren't under the influence of something? <laughs> yeah. So something's going on there, but it's not the kind of thinking that's going to teach you anything. You're not going to be able to learn anything with that kind of thinking. So sometimes we have to intervene to get our students' attention very directly. I should put that back up for a second, I guess. That kind of thinking is one level of metacognition, pretty basic level, but it's a kind of metacognition. When you're thinking about what you're reading and asking yourself, do I agree with this? Do I understand this? Does it make sense? Right? That's critical. Now, we talked about a couple of things. I've asked you about this and I want to now show you a, a brief video clip. But first you've got to hand it, put your hands up, put your right hand up, would you? Hold your right hand up. It's good for your hearts to hold your arm up. Huh? Shake it. Repeat after me. I solemnly swear not to look at my neighbor's paper. And when I do, not to laugh out loud. Now some of you have already done taken this oath once, so you're doubly bound, you science people. Um, I'm going to show you a little video clip here if all goes well, and I'm going to ask you to make a prediction. And for the science guys, you'll get this. All of you will get this right. And if you're not a science guy, you might not, or gal. Um, but I'll ask you to watch this. And I'll stop at a certain point and ask you to make a prediction. And then 
at that point, I don't want you to look at each other's papers, okay? You'll get a chance, but just at that point. Here we go. Um, me move along. So I belong to a group of four folks here who do research on learning physics. So we all interact, we all talk about how we do these things better, how do we find questions to get up the right kinds of conceptual models that we're, we're after. So it's a, it's a strong support group. Jose Mestre teaches a large introductory physics course. He and his colleagues have been experimenting with several new technologies to help make their courses more interactive. Class Talk uses graphing calculators to record and tabulate student responses during a lecture, enabling even a large class to work together. The students discuss the question and then register their hypotheses on their calculators. Some people have said one, moved over to two now. Their answers are instantly projected on the screen in the form of a histogram. I used to lecture and I found that students learned some things, but they didn't learn some other things that I wanted to learn, such as conceptual information. That's what I do. I put in 50 for BB. And then along this technology that allows me to poll students and to run the class very really interactively. I have here two steel balls. They're identical balls, and I'm going to release them from up here. One that's closest to me is going to go down this ramp here, <laughs> then go straight all the way up to here and then come up to the bottom. The other one is going to go down an identical piece of ramp. It goes straight for a little while, and then it dips down lower, and then it goes straight to about here, and it goes up to the same level as the original track, and it falls in line. Okay? The question I'm going to ask you is what? I'm going to ask you the same question he was going to ask. And this is where you really have to you know, not look at each other's papers so that you can predict and then find out if your prediction is right. There are three possible things that could happen. The two balls, and there, there's nothing fake about this. This is not, you know, this is all straight up. The two balls could arrive at the same time, one. The one on the flat track, you know, that's a little bit inclined, but flat, straight, could arrive first. Or the one on the dip track that goes down and up could arrive first. You with me? So three possibilities, right? If you think they arrive at the same time, write down the word same now. If you think the one on the flat track arrives first, write down flat. And if you think the dip track arrives first, write down dipped. No one has to know if you're wrong, right? You don't have to reveal this, but write it down. Same, flat, or dip. So if we had clickers in this room, that's what you'd be doing. You'd be choosing one of them, right? And we'd be looking at that. But we were able to do these things even in antediluvian times, right? Another way. So let's see, how many of you think, and none of us are going to memorize what you said about this. <laughs> are we? No. Same. I got a few hands up there. Flat. Not quite as many. Dip. And maybe about the same number said flat, but the majority. People with same again, let's put your hands up. All right. That must decide it right there. Right? <laughs> Do you want to see what happens? Let's watch. Now, you had a one in three chance of getting it right. <laughs> Let's be honest about that. Even if you don't know, you have a one in three chance. That's not bad odds, really. Which ball is to be first? So it's a much more interactive way of teaching. And when students don't fall asleep, they're really using the lecture. It's a very noisy, loud environment. So you never know quite what's going to happen. Brian, what do you say? He's going to show you. Faster and 
there's B only one on the top. Is that your reason? Did I paraphrase it okay? What do you think about reason? Yeah. They both are riding at the same speed, but by now, student active teaching doesn't require a well endowed college or expensive technology. Sure it does. Can't do anything without a lot of money. Right? <laughs> now, joking apart, um, Jose Mestre is a very famous physicist and physics education person, so thanks to him for doing this. And this was a few years ago. We now know, and this was exhibited well during the Science Institute, that there are nuanced ways to do this that are more powerful even than what he was doing. But what he's doing is he's taking the demonstration that all of us saw if we took physics and he's breaking it down in a different way. What I want to draw your attention to is the order of operations here in teaching turns out to be as important as the order of operations is in mathematics many times, right? So I'll try to turn this back on, see if we can make it happen. Um, he's basically, you know, doing this thing and there we go. You did your predictions. First, he poses a conceptual question. It's a question that's fundamentally important. Right? He's not going to use class time on anything else. And this is often known as a concept test, which was a, you know, something I never heard anybody say during the Institute, but from my mind is one of the most important innovations in the last few years. But you alluded to it in many ways without naming it that most of the time. Um, students then predicted the answer, as did you. Then, I didn't give you time to discuss your answers, but in a classroom you would, right? And some of you might change your mind and we might vote again to see. And during that time of changing your mind, what's happening is students are actually teaching each other and helping each other understand, and that's really fundamentally important, as you know. And then, so as not to leave them in pooled ignorance, which is one of the challenges of group work, right, he goes back and he shows them what happens. But, the point of this is really not to get the answer right, because you did have a one in three chance. The, chance, the point is, can they explain why the right answer is right and the wrong answer is wrong? With me? So when I was in high school and college, they did these kind of demonstrations, just like they do now. We had the same kind of apparatus, had been invented even then. But what they did was they did the demonstration, they told you what it meant, and then you moved on. He stops it gets people to make a prediction, gets them to think about it, and then engage. And it's that small tweak is where the learning takes place. Because once again, they get interested, they get engaged, they're thinking about it, and then they actually see what happens, they've got to explain it. So you might ask yourself, is there anything that I could do with my teaching where if I change just a little bit some of the things that I do, that I might get that kind of effect? And if you can think of it, write it on page nine. Because this is a powerful chain of events. It actually has an acronym in science, which I cannot remember. Does anybody remember it? Jenny, do you remember what they call this, these steps? There's, a, there's a, an acronym in science education about... Yeah. Predict, observe, explain. Is it, a, is it a sort of quick one? That's right. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of an objection that actually, an example of what you showed, I find, is something that would, I would never be able to give in the classroom of mine. Because? What I find, when you have large lectures, there's so many distractions, kids don't necessarily hear. The questions have to be very precisely worded. Mm -hmm. When you say, what is the outcome, and you do dipped, same, whatever, flat, those, those words do not relate to the question, what is the outcome? Uh, so yes, well, it's, well, well, your point's well taken on one level. I'm not doing this as a physicist, okay? So I was just doing it as a demonstration. On the other level, he's got 300 students in there. People do this in much bigger classes than that. So it is possible to do. But if you are more explicit with your questions, yeah. and yeah. it's written there, they can see it if they've liked out. Sure. Yeah, and so, you know, it is on a screen, they can see it. So, you know, it made it difficult for you guys to do it the way that I did it. Good point. Shall we move on? Okay. This is probably the most important point in all of this, and this is a quote from John Biggs. In the end, it's not what we do when we're in front of students, whether online or in person. It's actually what they do when we can't see them 
when they're not around us that makes the difference in terms of their learning. Most of the learning goes on when they're not around us. Because classrooms are lousy places to learn. They're distracting, right? They're problematic. So if students are going to learn, it's usually when we're not there. And John Biggs is a well-known, really well-known educationalist in, from Australia, but in the Commonwealth world. Now, page nine, once again, is going to be the only valuable page. That's why I put it last on its own. Uh, and we'll use it in just a minute, but make sure you have something written on page nine, because you'll need it. I want to turn to page four and just say something about this grid really quickly. So take a look at page four. I won't put the grid up on the screen. You wouldn't be able to read it on the screen. <laughs> so if you don't have a handout yet, make sure you look off on somebody's. Here's my question about page four. What's most important to this economics professor and how do you know? What's most important and how do you know? Not a trick question. Argumentation. Argumentation. How do you know? It's worth more points, right? So he's signaling through his rubric what he values. What's next most important? Oh, no. Knowledge, right? So here's the thing you have to know about this course. Like some of yours, 70 is the lowest passing grade. So it's a junior level course. If you got argumentation and knowledge perfect, you'd get the lowest passing grade. Now you know and I know that you cannot get a good job in economics with a bachelor's degree. Almost everybody in economics who wants a good job goes on to get a master's degree or a PhD. So all these students want to get into a good graduate school. They don't want to get a C minus, right? So he's manipulating their extrinsic motivation and saying to them, here's what I expect of you as juniors. The bottom line is the knowledge and the argumentation have to be really first rate. Nothing else will help you pass. There is no way that you can cobble together enough points to get over the line unless you are competent. If I were to look at all the syllabi in your university, would I find that in some courses people can somehow get enough points to pass without being competent? Not in yours, but in others. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you, <laughs> I see it every day, day in and day out. And if there's a way to get enough points to pass or to get the grade you want without working, why wouldn't you? That's not cheating, that's being rational. So he has fixed the game and said to them, you know, you're juniors, I expect you to do this. Here's how he deals with the problem of rubrics often having a low ceiling. People complain about rubrics, too many students get A's, too many students get B's without actually achieving high. Notice the last thing on here, it says striving for excellence and creativity and he's got 20 points there. That's the difference between a B minus and, you know, the highest A, right? So what he says to students is, the university hired me because I'm an expert. They gave me this course to teach because I'm an expert. I write books and articles and serve on journals. So I'm going to give you feedback on whether what you've written is of a standard, you know, is competent or much more than competent. And so what he can say is, um, Susan, I've known you since you were a freshman. This is solid writing, but it's dull, Susan. You can do much better than this, right? If you want to get into grad school, you're going to have to do better than this. Take it back and let's spice it up a bit. Or you can say, Dave, there's nothing about this that hasn't been written in 10 articles. You, you need a new angle, right? Once again, it's good work, but if you want to end up working for the government, this is it, right? You're there, right? If you want another kind of job, not there, right? And he can say to students who are competent but don't want to be any more than competent, you've done well, you know your stuff, you know, and if you don't want to go to graduate school, you're well prepared. That's okay. You're ready for the work world. So what he's basically interested in saying is if a person gets a C from my course, they are competent. Can we all put our hands on our hearts and say if a person gets a C from my course, they're competent. <laughs> sure you can. Um, now, here's how he does it, and I'm going to say this really quickly, but you can read about these kinds of things if you want to. He's got about 150 students, third years, right? Pretty well prepared by this time. And so here's their major project. They take a, a big midterm with millions of multiple choice questions and they write a big project. The project gets rewritten several times. In week three, they have to give their first draft to another student who reads it with the rubric, this, marks it, 
and that student gives them some feedback. Now, they're juniors. They, they know some things, right? In week six, they give the rubric to the teaching fellow, and the teaching fellow will not read it unless it comes in with the drafts, the former drafts, and marked up from the other student. And in week eight, it goes to the professor, and it has to have the TA's marks, the other student's marks, and the student's own marks on it, and he has to have the, the previous drafts on it, or he won't read it. And if he doesn't read it, they won't get a mark, and if they don't get a mark, they won't pass. In week eight, halfway through the term, right, or more than halfway through the term is when the professor finally reads it, he cancels all his classes for a week and he sits down with everybody for 15 minutes. Grueling, right, to do this, but for each of them he's written some comments. He talks with them about what they can do to improve the paper, he sends the comments to them by email. They must respond to the comments by email. They can say, I'm not going to do that, I don't agree with you, I don't care, I'm happy with a D, whatever. Or, here's what I'm going to do, I think I have a better idea. It's when they respond to his email and comments that he knows whether they understood his feedback and whether they read it. So his feedback is consequential because he will not mark their final paper unless they've done that. Now the students have rewritten this three or four or five or sometimes more times. He's reading a pretty good draft and when they hand it in for the final time they have to hand in all this stuff with it and it takes them a few minutes to give them their final grade. They get no feedback on the final paper. Why would they? It's not going to help them. Feedback only helps you when you are going to do more work. If you're giving students feedback on something that's finished, you are wasting your time. Point blank. You can say to students, if you want feedback, come and see me. And you know who will come and see you? Yes, you do. The A students and the A minus students will come and see you, usually to argue about their grade. Okay? But it's not going to help the rest of them. So think about making your life easier by pushing your feedback earlier into the course, which you can only do by design. By design. You've got to design it in to make that happen. What students cannot escape is our tests and graded things. They can escape coming to class. They can escape participating. They can sometimes escape the sections even. But they can't escape the tests and the papers and the other things they give. So for the students, if it's a good curriculum, it's because the assessments are good. Good lectures are a bonus. They're lovely, they're wonderful, and they're inspiring. But the work of learning doesn't happen because someone's lecturing to you. It happens because you went off and did the reading and did the work, did the lab work. Now I want to think just with you for a minute about grading and how grading might be different than it is. Or maybe it's not for you. Suppose we expected mastery of students. We ensured that they were competent. We didn't pass anybody who wasn't competent. But we promoted excellence. Then we could take our grades and we could say, well, a B is mastery, a C is competence, and an A is excellence. We would have solved grade inflation. Because if we could demonstrate this, then if everybody got an A, it would mean that we were doing a really excellent job and everybody was well prepared. Will that ever happen? Not till pigs fly. <laughs> but could everybody be competent? Yeah. You can get very close to that. People have proven this, right, if you do the right things. But it's a hard push. Right now, in most universities and most programs, we don't know what each other's grades mean at all. And there's no way to find out because it's secrets. <laughs> I don't think that that's appropriate for core courses that students are required to take, to have secret standards for grading. I think that's problematic. For your electives, that might be okay, but for core courses that students are required to take, how can we defend having secret grading standards? Here's the parrot test. So my question is, could a parrot who could type and had an excellent vocabulary in your discipline sit in the back of your classroom, memorize your lectures and the, you know, the readings even perhaps, and could just by remembering, just through rote memorization, could they pass your course? If a course in a university can be passed by rote memorization, I don't think it's higher learning. So the parrot test is this. If someone could parrot your course and pass it, you fail the parrot test. Now you may be happy with that, but most of my colleagues aren't. They say that's not what we want in higher education. So here's backward design. We have intended learning outcomes. We know what we want students to be able to do. We create our summative assessments, then diagnosis, then formative, and then last, we create our learning assignments and our lectures. And 
some of you have been working on backward design for weeks and in this institute. Um, the idea here is that first we start with what we want students to be able to demonstrate they know and be able to do, figure out how we'll know that, and everything else follows that, which is the opposite of the way that most of us have learned to sort of create courses. But it is the way that most of the MOOCs and most of the courses that are being created by the private providers are being designed. So you need to know this is what our competition is doing. It's the way they do business. Okay? I'm going to skip a couple of things and just show you the tram test. So here's the tram test. I, I lived in Melbourne for five years. You can call it the bus test. Okay? <clears throat> so here's the thing. If I were to get hit by the tram, which I took to work every day, if I were to get hit by the tram, could my colleagues pick up my syllabus and my materials and my assessments and fairly grade my students? Suppose I got hit mid-semester. Is my course, my required course, transparent enough that my colleagues could fairly grade as I would grade? Is our curriculum, in other words, sustainable in that way? I won't ask you for a show of hands, but you know, think to yourself, is your curriculum of your course sustainable? Would it pass the parent test first? For quality, would it pass the tram test? Just grade or teach? The whole thing. Could they run the course? You know, could they grade students? Could they teach it? Could they prepare students based on the, the documentation of that required course? Notice I'm not talking about electives. I'll give you a free pass on electives. Okay. So this takes analysis, but it takes design to fix. So page nine. Do you have any ideas you can use? Possibly use. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Last bit. Take a look at page nine. If you've got more than one thing, some of you did this already, so you'll know where I'm going with it. If you've got more than one thing, circle one idea on page nine that you think is particularly attractive, might work out for you, might be helpful to your students, and circle that one. If you've got five things, pick one. If you've got one, that's it. If you have none, well, hang in there. You might hear one. And here's what I'll ask you to do as our last thing before we evaluate the session. <clears throat> With the nearest three or four people around you, I'd like you to say three things about your chosen application. One, what is it? Two, why does it appeal to you? Why do you think it might be useful to you and your students? And three, how might you use it? So what is it? Why do you think it might be useful? How might you use it? And I'd like you to do that all in about 20 seconds. <laughs> So take just a few seconds and practice in your head how you're going to say this. Because you're going to get a chance to hear some good ideas from two or three other people. Practice in your head what you're going to say. Silence. Silence for a moment. Practice without talking. Rehearse what you're going to say. What? Why? How? Form your groups of three or four. Share 15 seconds each. Let's go. Bang. Sign it for him. Uh, oh, oh, just, just your name. What's your name? Oh, um, Laka, L, uh, Laka, Laka. Can you spell it for me? L-A-T-H-A. Make sure you all talk.
day. Now I have one last favor to ask you, and this is important to me and important to the faculty center. So if you could do this for us, we'd appreciate it. And that is, if you could just take an index card, or if you didn't have an index card, any little piece of paper will do. So all of you have index cards. Just write the Roman numerals one, two, three on it. Like that, one, two, three. Everybody got that? And here are the three questions and the scale. So using the scale with one, meaning none, two low, three to satisfactory, four high, five very high. If you just answer those with a number. And if you'd like to write any comments, feel free, obviously, to write comments. But we thought we'd try to get just a little bit of feedback from you on this. And I might ask Patricia if she can collect those at the door. A couple of people. And maybe someone can collect them over there as you go out. <clears throat> let me thank you for your time and attention. And let me thank you for your commitment to your students and to their futures. You know, there is no more important job than ours, except for all those teachers who teach younger people. You know, which is probably, in a way, more important. Um, but we're part of a noble and wonderful and great profession, and I hope we can keep it that way. Um, Bill Bennett and one of his colleagues just wrote a, a book. There are a lot of books that, like this out there now. Let me see this. Is College Worth It? And this is an analysis, basically, of the economics of college. Um, SUNY Stony Brook is mentioned in here in terms of return on investment. I'll leave it to you to find out what Stony Brook University, where you come out on this, or you can ask me later, I'll show you on the table. But the basic idea here is that you know and I know that, that for many students, college is very expensive, and it's many years of their lives. We owe it to them and to the rest of the nation to make sure that that time is well used. So I know you do. Good luck. Godspeed. Thanks.